Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this sixth and final session of Joy and Felicity, our online seminar series for Lent 2022. Over the past five weeks, we've enjoyed some really excellent sessions exploring the theme of prayer book and monarchy, and I'm delighted to see so many of you taking part tonight. Over the last few weeks, I think we've all greatly benefited um, from the learning of some outstanding speakers. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, let's begin with prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who of thy tender love towards mankind, has sent thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, that all mankind should follow the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may both follow the example of his patience and also be made partakers of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth. Most heartily we beseech thee with thy favour to behold our most gracious Sovereign Lady Queen Elizabeth, and so replenish her with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that she may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. And you her plenteously with heavenly gifts, grant her in health and wealth long to live, strengthen her that she may vanquish and overcome all her enemies, and finally, after this life, she may attain everlasting joy and felicity through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Eleanor Parker. Dr. Parker is lecturer in medieval English literature at Brasenose College, Oxford. She completed her doctorate at the University of Oxford in 2013. She then held a Mellon postdoctoral fellowship at the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, researching interpretations of the Danish Cot Conquest in medieval historical writing at Worcester College. The research focuses on historical narratives in literature produced in England between the years 1000 and 1400. She's especially interested in narratives about the Danes in England, representations of the pre-conquest past, and the intersections between historical writing, fiction and romance. She blogs about medieval literature and her blog, A Clerk of Oxford, won the Longman History Today Award for Digital History in 2015. She's a columnist for History Today, has written for BBC History Magazine and History Extra, and has published translations of Old and Middle English poetry. She joins us this evening to speak about the Royal Saints for a presentation entitled Kings of the Angles and Kings of the English, the Royal Saints in the Prayer Book Calendar. I am delighted to hand over to Dr. Eleanor Parker. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be able to, to speak to you as part of this series, which I've been enjoying very much myself. Um, and I was asked to speak on the topic of royal saints in the prayer book calendar um, to discuss what we can learn from those saints about the relationship between the church and the monarchy. Um, so what I'm going to do is first to give an introduction to the royal saints who appear in the calendar of the prayer book um, to talk about their lives and the history of their veneration and then to think about what their inclusion in that calendar can tell us about the intertwined history of the English monarchy and the English church. So at this point, I'm gonna share my screen. And hopefully you'll be able to see this. So I'm gonna be talking about four royal saints who appear in the prayer book calendar. Um, I am leaving aside entirely um, King Charles the Martyr, who of course also falls into this category. Um, I'm gonna concentrate on these four um, medieval saints, if you'll forgive me for doing that. Um, and these four saints are, are a very interesting group. They're all Anglo-Saxon saints, the members of pre-conquest royal dynasties, and specifically, in fact, the dynasties of East Anglia and Wessex. Um, so we have one woman and three men, St. Ethelreda of Ely, St. Edmund of East Anglia, St. Edward, King of the West Saxons, um, or more usually called Edward the Martyr, um, and then Edward the Confessor. 
So on the slide there, you can see the dates and the titles um, under which they appear in the prayer book calendar. So you can see, for instance, that um, Edward the Martyr appears twice uh, with a commemoration of both his date of death on the 18th of March um, and also his translation feast in June, whereas Edmund of East Anglia features on the date of his death in November, um, and Ethel Dreda and Edward the Confessor both appear on their translation feasts only. Um, they both happen to be in October, um, rather than on the dates of their deaths, which are in June and January, respectively. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit more as I go on. So before I talk about these particular saints, it's worth saying first that, of course, England has numerous other royal saints who do not appear in the prayer book calendar, to say nothing of the royal saints of other nations, of course. Um, the medieval English church celebrated a very large number of saints, and only a small number of those feasts, as I'm sure you know, survived into the prayer book. So among the royal Anglo-Saxon saints um, who are commemorated in pre-Reformation uh, English calendars, but who do not appear in the prayer book, are, for instance, all the royal saints of Northumbria, uh, Mercia and Kent, people like St Oswald of Northumbria or Kenelm of Mercia, or Ethelbert and Bertha of Kent, the first Christian king and queen in Anglo-Saxon England, and there are many others. And it's worth noting that before we start, as a reminder that these four saints appear in the calendar for a reason, um, and as the result of a process of selection, rather than because they were the only, or even really the most important necessarily, of England's royal saints. So we have to think about why these four do appear when so many others do not. At the Reformation, of course, all non-biblical saints were initially excised from the calendar, but in 1561, when the calendar was revised, some of the saints earlier removed were added back in. And it was at this point that these four royal saints returned, along with a small selection of other medieval British saints, um, people like St Chad or Richard of Chichester, um, Alfe, Dunstan of Canterbury, Hugh of Lincoln, those kinds of people. And it was this expanded version of the calendar which then survived into the 1662 prayer book. Um, although some of medieval England's most popular saints did not return, Thomas Beckett being the most striking example. So really the presence of these four royal saints reflects the priorities and interests of the mid 16th century um, around the time of the 1561 revision of the calendar. Um, and I'm gonna sort of talk about that a bit more later. Between them, these four figures span the history of the Anglo-Saxon church from the early days of the conversion to the eve of the Norman conquest. And their place in the Elizabethan prayer book signals an important sense of continuity with the Anglo-Saxon church, reflecting a connection between church and monarchy, which had grown up in tandem with the nation of England itself, and which must have been intended to reflect something important about the English identity of the new church of England. So let me say a little about each of these saints. I'll begin with Ethelreda, um, or Ethelthrith, as is her old English name. Ethelreda is the usual Latinized form. Um, chronologically, she is the first of these four medieval saints, but it also feels quite appropriate to begin with a queen. Um, a reminder, fitting in this jubilee year, that this country has a strong heritage of royal queenship, going back to the very earliest days of the English church. Christian queens predominate among the saints of the early Anglo-Saxon period, um, quite some time before we had many Christian kings. Born in the 7th century, Ethelreda predates the nation of England, but not the idea of a church of the English. In fact, her story has a prominent role in what was the foundational narrative of the medieval English church, the Historia Ecclesiastica, by the great Anglo-Saxon Anglo historian Bede. And it's largely because of Bede that we know so much about Ethelreda's life. She was the daughter of a man named Anna, King of East Anglia, and she was probably born in the 630s, at a time when Christianity in Anglo-Saxon England was still only a few decades old. The independent kingdoms of Anglo-Saxon England separately converted to Christianity over the course of the 7th century, and in East Anglia the kings went back and forth between paganism and Christianity for a little while. Um, if you want to picture what this period of Anglo-Saxon England was like, we're very close in time and space here to the Sutton Hoo ship burial. Um, it might well have been one of Ethelreda's recent ancestors who was buried at Sutton Hoo. So very much a royal and a high status background. As a young woman, Ethelreda was married twice to two men of royal status. 
but the early sources say that she remained a virgin throughout both marriages because her ultimate aspiration was to enter religious life. As you might imagine, this caused some tension with her second husband, uh, King of Northumbria, so she parted from him and returned to East Anglia, uh, to lands which she owned around the Isle of Ely in what's now Cambridgeshire. There she founded and led a monastery, um, a double monastery, a community of both men and women, as was common in the early medieval period. As abbess, as abbess of Ely, Ethelreda was revered for the holiness of her life, and after her death, she became venerated as a saint. As I said, the main source for her life is Bede's ecclesiastical history. Um, Bede was born a few years before her death in 679, um, and he had met people who knew her, so he was very well informed about her life. And in his history, Bede not only gives a narrative of her life, but also includes a hymn of his own composition to the saint, suggesting a particular interest in her. And this is a rather lovely piece. I'm quite fond of it because it's an acrostic hymn um, following the letters of the alphabet in, in each line, as you can see from the manuscript image and from the translation there. Um, and in this hymn, Bede, he, he celebrates Ethelreda as an English equivalent to the virgin martyrs of the wider church. So he starts off by talking about Agnes and Agatha and Cecilia uh, and so on. And then he concludes, our age at length in triumphs such as these partakes through Ethelreda's victories. Queenly by birth, an earthly crown she wore, right noble, but a heavenly pleased her more. Scorning the marriage bed, a virgin wife, twelve years she reigned, then sought a cloistered life. Unspotted to her heavenly spouse she came, virgin in soul, her virgin robe and frame. When sixteen winters they had lain entombed, Christ willing it, still fresh and unconsumed. Yea, from their touch, Eve's tempter flees dismayed, zealous for evil, vanquished by a maid. So the idea is that Ethelreda is the English and the modern counterpart, the, the person of our age, um, to the virgin saints of the early church. But Bede also emphasizes the importance of her queenly status. And Ethelreda was the first of a royal lineage of female saints within her family dynasty. At least three and possibly four of the daughters of King Anna became leaders of religious houses and were honoured as saints, um, and so did some of their daughters and, and later descendants. And this is quite typical of what we see in the first century of Anglo-Saxon Christianity. Royal women from all the different Anglo-Saxon kingdoms took an interest in supporting and promoting the new church, often much more enthusiastically than their male counterparts. Over several generations, through the marriages they contracted and the monastic houses they founded, Ethelreda's sisters and, her daughter, and their daughters formed a matrilineal dynasty of spiritual and political power in the developing English church. In particular, her sister St. Shakespeare, who succeeded her as abbess of Ely, played an important role in promoting Ethelreda's sanctity after her death. So throughout the Anglo-Saxon period and into the later Middle Ages, Ely remained an important monastery and Ethelreda's legacy as its founder meant that her fame endured for many centuries. It's now, of course, the beautiful Ely Cathedral, where the former site of her shrine can still be seen. But she was widely venerated elsewhere too. In medieval sources, she is probably the single most important English female saint among the large number of saintly women venerated in the Anglo-Saxon period. And she's certainly the one most extensively written about in medieval sources, both before the Norman Conquest and in the later Middle Ages. As well as Bede, there are later accounts of her life in English, Latin and Anglo-Norman. And for all these writers, Ethelreda served as the preeminent model of a holy English queen, her sanctity enhanced by her royal status, by also, but also by the choice that she made to put her faith and her desire for a religious life ahead of personal security and comfort. It's presumably because of this status and this widespread popularity that Ethelreda's feast was allowed to return to the prayer book calendar. Her usual feast day in the medieval period was the 23rd of June, but she also has a translation feast on the 17th of October, um, and it's only on this latter date that she appears in the prayer book. Our second royal saint is also from the East Anglian royal dynasty, a king of East Anglia from almost 200 years after Ethelreda. This is King Edmund, King, St Edmund, King and Martyr, one of the most important and popular saints of medieval England. Edmund lived in the second half of the ninth century, the period when Viking raids, um, as depicted on the slide, were first beginning to be a threat to the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. 
In 865, a very large Viking army descended on the country and overran almost all the kingdoms of Anglo-Saxon England one by one. They conquered Northumbria first, then they came south to East Anglia, where they killed King Edmund in 869. The actual circumstances of Edmund's death are not certain. It may be that he was killed in battle against the Vikings, um, but the legend of his death, as it came to be told in the early medieval sources, is that when the Vikings appeared, they demanded money and they told Edmund to submit to them. But Edmund said he would not submit to heathen rulers unless they accepted Christianity, which they refused to do. And Edmund refused to renounce Christ. So the Vikings captured him and tied him to a tree where they shot at him until, as the Anglo-Saxon sources say, he was covered with arrows like the spikes of a hedgehog. Finally, they beheaded him and hid his severed head so that his people couldn't give him a proper burial. But the story goes that a wolf found his head and protected it. And when his friends came to look for it, shouting, where are you? The head was able to speak and could answer, here, here, so they could bury him properly. And those are details first given in Anglo-Saxon sources from the last decades of the 10th century, so just over 100 years after Edmund's death. They are, of course, legendary details, but they reflect in themselves the early and great popularity of Edmund's cult. He was already the subject of legend and veneration by the end of the 10th century. And these elements of Edmund tied to a tree, shot with arrows, and the wolf protecting his head are very frequently depicted in medieval art, both in manuscripts and in church art. Um, here are a few examples just from the uh, manuscripts of the 14th and 15th centuries, but there are many, many more. Um, images of Edmund are found in churches all over England, but the centre of his veneration was, of course, his shrine at Bury St Edmunds. Um, that's the ruined abbey church at Bury St Edmunds, roughly where his shrine would have been. <laughs> By the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, Edmund had already, in a sense, been adopted um, as a kind of national saint of England, uh, like Ethelreda, venerated outside what had been his former kingdom. An account of his life, written by the influential Anglo-Saxon author Alfrich at the end of the 10th century, comments that the English are not deprived of the Lord's saints, since in England lie such saints as this holy king, and blessed Cuthbert, and St Ethelreda in Ely, and her sister, that's Shakespeare, um, in corrupt in body, for the strengthening of the faith. There are also many other saints among the English who work many miracles, as is widely known, to the praise of the Almighty in whom they believed. So Alfrich, a very prolific author, wrote about many lives of saints, but the fact that he here links Edmund and Ethelreda and Cuthbert um, out of all the many Anglo-Saxon saints whom he could have mentioned, uh, suggests that they already had a particular status by the end of the 10th century, and also that their English identity was an important factor to him. Um, these saints illustrate that the English are not deprived of God's favour as revealed through the actions of his saints. Alfred's account of Edmund presents him as a model of Christian kingship. This is his opening description of Edmund. Edmund, the blessed king of the East Angles, was wise and honourable and always honoured almighty God in noble conduct. He was humble and virtuous and endured so resolutely that he would never submit to shameful vices, nor on either side deviate from his virtuous practices but was always mindful of the true teaching. Have you been appointed as ruler? Do not exalt yourself, but be among men as if you are one of them. He was generous to the poor and like a father to widows and with benevolence always guided his people to righteousness and restrained the violent and blessedly lived in the true faith. So this is very much a description of the medieval ideal of a just Christian king. And in describing Edmund's decision to suffer death rather than submit to the Vikings, Alfred emphasizes again that this is a kingly act. Um, he says, King Edmund called a bishop, the one who was nearest him at the time, and consulted with him how he should answer the savage Viking Ingvar. The bishop was afraid for this terrible misfortune and for the king's life, and said it seemed wise to him that he should submit to what Ingvar had divide, demanded of him. Then the king became very quiet and looked at the ground and at last said to him in a kingly manner, alas, bishop, the poor people of this land are so shamefully mistreated and it would be preferable now to me to fall in battle so that my people might be able to enjoy their land. It has never been my custom to take flight. I would rather die if I must for my own land and almighty God knows that I will never want to turn away from his service or from his true love, whether I live or die. So it is a choice explicitly taken out of love for his people and his kingdom and his loyalty to God. So it's as a king that he suffers martyrdom. 
And it was very much this which was at the root of Edmund's importance as an image of Christian kingship. By the 11th century, Edmund was seen as effectively one of the patron saints of England. He was adopted by the Norman dynasty as a kind of national saint. This is, of course, before St. George was kind of widely accepted as uh, England's patron saint. And because he was a royal saint, he was especially associated with kings of England in the later medieval period. He was not actually an ancestor of any later English kings. Um, none of these four saints were, as none had any direct descendants. Um, and Edmund and Ethelreda were not even really predecessors. Um, Edmund was an East Anglian king and the East Anglian dynasty died with him. Um, but in the period after his death, the kings of Wessex, the only dynasty to survive the Viking invasions intact, extended their power over the other kingdoms of Anglo-Saxon England, including East Anglia, and so began to think of themselves as kind of heirs to all of history and heritage, including the inheritance of Edmund and Ethelreda. So Edmund was effectively being treated as a royal saint of England, a patron of the country and the monarchy by the late Anglo-Saxon period, and that continued into the later Middle Ages. So he appears, for instance, famously in the Wilton Diptych here from the late 14th century, where Richard II is shown in the company of St Edmund and Edward the Confessor and John the Baptist, all kneeling before the Virgin and Child. Um, Edmund is shown in those beautiful royal robes and with the arrow that killed him. So the sense here is clearly that both Edmund and Edward are national patron saints, and saints especially associated with the monarchy. Like Ely, Bury St Edmunds was an important monastery, often visited and supported by English kings. Um, this is a manuscript image which shows the young Henry VI praying at the shrine of St Edmund um, from a, an early 15th century manuscript. At the time of his visit to Bury St Edmunds, um, Henry was in his teens, which is why he's rather a minuscule figure here. Um, and this uh, manuscript was an account of Edmund's life, which was given to the young king, um, presenting him, presenting Edmund as a model for Henry to follow. So Edmund represented a kind of kingship which could embody both military strength and a more sacrificial mode of kingship. Um, and he's often depicted in later medieval texts as a successful warrior who met his death while defending his kingdom and his faith. In that, he presents an interesting contrast to our next royal martyr, um, whose claim to that title is rather less secure than Edmund's. Um, our last two royal saints, both named Edward, were uncle and nephew, although in fact they never met. Both were members of what had originally been the dynasty of the kings of Wessex, um, which was by their time in the late 10th and 11th centuries, the royal line now of a unified kingdom of England. And Edward the Martyr, born around 962, was the son of Edgar, king of England, um, a great grandson of Alfred the Great. Edward's was a short and rather tragic life. His father, Edgar, died in 975, leaving two young sons by two different women. The elder, Edward, was in his teens at the time of his father's death, and the other, Ethelred, probably better known to you as Ethelred the Unready, um, was a, a, a bit younger, about nine, something like that. Um, and under the customs of Anglo-Saxon inheritance, both sons had a claim to the throne. It wasn't automatic that the elder son should inherit. Both had factions supporting them. Um, Edward's claim was supported by St Dunstan, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, and others, and Ethelred's faction was headed by his mother, Elfrith. And these factions correlated to some degree with opposing movements in the 10th century church, so the boys became figureheads for a dispute that was not only about the succession to the throne. Edward's faction initially prevailed and he became king, but less than three years later he was murdered while still only in his teens. The murder took place at Corf in Dorset in 978. The circumstances are quite unclear, um, but his brother's supporters were blamed for his death. Um, the, the, the sort of legendary version of his death is depicted in that uh, manuscript illustration there, which shows him being uh, poisoned um, by a cup of drink uh, offered to him by his stepmother, who is uh, on the right of the image there. Um, but that may just be legend. Um, and, but certainly in the eyes of those who had supported him, he was a martyr. And this is how a contemporary source, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, describes his death. In this year, King Edward was killed at the Gap of Corfe on the 18th of March in the evening, and he was buried at Wareham without any royal honours. No worse deed than this has been committed for the English people since the time when they first came to Britain. Men murdered him, but God glorified him. In life he was an earthly king, now after death he is a heavenly saint. His earthly kinsman would not avenge him, but his heavenly father has greatly avenged him. 
The earthly slayers wanted to blot out his memory upon earth, but the divine avenger has spread his memory abroad across heaven and earth. Those who would not bow before his living body now humbly bow on their knees to his dead bones. Now we may perceive that the wisdom of men and their plans and counsels are as nothing compared to the purpose of God. This is very strong language um, coming from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and you can see from this that the murder was very deeply felt by at least some contemporaries. It must have been that sense of outrage and injustice which led to Edward being venerated as a saint and martyr. It has to be said that there is no clear sense from the contemporary sources that he had any other claim to sainthood. Um, he was, of course, very young at the time of his death, and unlike Edmund, he didn't in any sense die as a martyr for the faith. Um, but the murder of a young prince was a very shocking event, and in such circumstances where a young royal suffered violent death, it wasn't uncommon for the victim to be venerated as a saint. There are numerous other medieval examples of kings or princes who die in this way being elevated to sainthood. Um, and of course that's partly the result of a belief in the sacred nature of kingship itself. A king is God's anointed, not just a political leader, uh, and so the violent death, um, their violent death, is an especially shocking and sacrilegious act. And there's certainly a sense in the Chronicle that Edward's sanctity is kind of God's vengeance for his murder. The divine avenger has glorified him. Note also in this Chronicle entry the insistence that this was an event of national importance. It talks about the English people, the Anglican, um, and situates this within the history of the English. Uh, so since the time that the English came to Britain, um, in other words, sort of 500 years earlier since the Anglo-Saxon settlement. Um, so that's a very strong condemnation, but it's also a statement uh, about the place of this king and his death within a much longer narrative of English history. By the end of the 10th century, with England now a political unity ruled by a single dynasty, the murder of the king was all the more shocking um, and it had long lasting implications. Edward's younger brother, Ethelred, who succeeded him as king, was instrumental in promoting his veneration as a saint no doubt partly to appease those who had been on Edward's side by publicly atoning for the murder, and perhaps also out of a personal sense of regret. Ethelred himself would have been really too young to have taken any part in his brother's death, um, but he was the beneficiary and it was presumably done on his behalf. And Edward's death cast a very long shadow over Ethelred's reign, which was troubled for all kinds of other reasons too, um, and which culminated in the invasion of England by the Vikings. Medieval historians quite frequently interpret the troubles of Ethelred's time as a kind of punishment from God on the English people uh, because of Edward's murder. And especially they tend to say that the dynastic upheavals which affected England in the 11th century, um, when the country was first of all conquered by the Vikings, but then of course by the Normans, could all be interpreted as direct punishment um, for the murder of the king. That's how seriously they take it. So while Edward is today a fairly minor saint by comparison to the, the other three that I'm talking about, his death was certainly believed by medieval historians to have had momentous consequences for England and the English monarchy. Edward's shrine was at Shaftesbury Abbey, and if you visit the ruins of Shaftesbury now, you can see the site of his tomb sort of marked out among the ruins. And he appears in the prayer book calendar twice, as I said earlier, on the feast of the 18th of March, and also on his translation feast of the 20th of June. And this is perhaps a little surprising, considering that he is, as I said, a, a rather minor saint, um, but it's probably explained by the influence of the Sarum calendar on the early versions of the prayer book. Um, Shaftesbury is, of course, in the Diocese of Salisbury, just down the road from Salisbury Cathedral. Um, this image of Edward is from Salisbury Cathedral. Um, so Edward's feast was naturally very important in the Sarum calendar, um, and that's most likely the reason that he features so prominently in the prayer book. And finally, we come to Edward the Confessor, whose story I expect you already know at least something about. Um, Edward was the son of King Ethelred. He was probably named after his uncle, Edward the Martyr, sort of as part of Ethelred's um, promotion of his half-brother's cult. Um, Edward was born around 1003, 25 years or so after Edward's death. As a young man, he suffered the consequences of his father's troubled reign. He was forced to flee to Normandy when England was conquered by the Vikings. He only returned to England in 1041. 
In 1042, he was accepted as king. He married Edith, daughter of the powerful Earl Godwin, but they had no children. Um, and then after his death in January 1066, William of Normandy, a family connection of Edward on his mother's side, claims that Edward had promised him the throne with consequences that I imagine you all know. Um, for the Norman regime, Edward's connections to Normandy um, and especially this supposed promise to William were key arguments supporting the legitimacy of the Norman conquest. And it's really for that reason that later kings of England began to venerate England, uh, sorry, venerate Edward as a saint. That veneration was very largely the product of the 12th and 13th centuries, and it was driven by royal support for Edward's shrine at Westminster Abbey. Edward had refounded Westminster Abbey at the end of his life, and his burial there is depicted on the Bay of Tapestry. Um, and it was there that his veneration really began in around 1138, when uh, the prior of Westminster, Osbert of Clare, wrote a vita of Edward, encouraging a cult which led to his canonization in 1161. On the 13th of October, uh, 1163, yes, uh, he was translated into a new shrine at Westminster, and that's the date on which he's commemorated in the prayer book calendar. The date of his death, the 5th of January, is inconveniently the eve of the Epiphany, um, and so the translation feast in October, uh, October offered a useful alternative. In the Middle Ages, Edward was not really a widely popular saint, unlike St Edmund or Ethelreda, but he was consistently venerated by the English monarchy. Um, and this association was especially strengthened by Henry III, who ruled England for a large part of the 13th century. Henry took a particular interest in Edward. He was crowned at Westminster Abbey with St Edward's crown, as subsequent monarchs of England were to be. He supported the renovation of Westminster, he chose it as the location of his own burial, and he named his eldest son after the saint, later Edward I. Um, and it's because of that that Edward once again became a royal name, its bearers including significantly members of the Tudor dynasty, including of course Edward VI. So this image comes from a manuscript recounting the life of St Edward, uh, which was originally written for Henry III's queen, Eleanor of Provence, and the manuscript belonged to their daughter-in-law, um, Eleanor of Castile, the queen of Edward I. So over two generations, we see this interest in, in Edward among the monarchy. And this image depicts the 1163 opening of Edward's tomb. It shows Henry II, Henry III's grandfather, uh, kissing the king's body. The manuscript is extensively and beautifully illustrated um, and the illustrations show similarities not only with other manuscripts produced at Westminster in this period but also with wall paintings made in the 1250s at West Windsor Castle. So it's very much a royal manuscript um, and it's a particularly vivid illustration of the very close link between Edward's cult and the medieval monarchy. We've already seen that Edward also appears with Richard II on the Wilton Diptych. Let's look at it again because it's just so beautiful. Um, and you may know that Edward's tomb still survives at Westminster Abbey. I've shown images of the sites of the destroyed shrines of the other three saints at Bury St Edmunds and Ely and Shaftesbury, but Edward's was almost the only medieval shrine to survive the English Reformation when so many others were destroyed. So to draw all this together, I'll just make a few final points. First of all, I think it's worth noting, as this image um, particularly indicates, the role of later kings and queens of England in promoting the continued veneration of these royal saints. These four figures were not all among the most generally popular of England's medieval saints, but they were certainly the most important to the English monarchy. And that is predominantly the reason why they returned to the prayer book calendar. We can distinguish between Ethelreda and Edmund on the one hand, who were genuinely popular and much loved saints, widely venerated across England, and on the other hand, the two Edwards, um, who were very largely saints promoted by the royal family, because they were identified as, in some way, saintly predecessors, ancestors in a spiritual, if not a literal sense. And secondly, although in many ways the Book of Common Prayer, of course, represented um, a self-conscious break from the medieval church, the history of these saints is a reminder that it was not possible entirely to eradicate the medieval past, and nor did all reformers seek to do so. Since its earliest days, the English church had supported and been supported by the kings and queens of England. The very idea of Englishness, of the English as a people or a nation, had been, since the days of Bede, bound up with the history and character of the English church and its saints. The stories of, story of these saints is in many ways the story of England itself. 
And it's no coincidence that the 1550s and 60s, when these saints were included in the prayer book calendar, was the period which saw what was in effect the birth of modern scholarly study of Anglo-Saxon history and literature, a movement which included, for instance, the collection and preservation of Anglo-Saxon manuscripts from dispersed monastic libraries, as well as the rediscovery of the works of Bede and Alfridge, which were printed and studied in this period, um, in part as evidence for the practices of the early English church. All of this represented a renewed interest in the roots of English Christianity and a developing perception of the Anglo-Saxon period as a formative time for both religious and national identity in England. As the new Church of England sought to define what it meant to be an English church, the study of Anglo-Saxon history seemed to offer precedents and models which could be helpful. Distant as the world of Anglo-Saxon England might have been in some ways, for the Elizabethan church, there was still much of value and interest in the histories of its saints. Thank you. Dr. Parker, could I thank you very much indeed for that fascinating presentation. Um, we come now to an opportunity for questions and comments. Um, if anyone wishes to ask a question, you can do so um, either by raising a yellow hand on the screen um, or you can type a question into the chat box, whichever you prefer. Any questions for Dr. Parker or comments, observations? Mr. Bimson, please. Thank you. What do we make, if anything, of the fact that these saints are included in the calendar, but as far as my memory serves me correct, have no liturgical provision for their, for their days? Is it some kind of, I don't want to say social acknowledgement, but I can't quite, I can't quite think of the right word. Just as, just as, for example, the Feast of the Translation of St Martin is included, and might have been included because in the social consciousness, Martin Mass mm -hmm. was, a, was, was an important medieval uh, feast and fairs, etc. So I just wondered if there was anything to be said about the fact that they're in the calendar, but with no liturgical provision. Yes, I think that's, that's certainly a significant point. I mean, there's no sense in which these are intended to be celebrated liturgically as they would have been in the medieval church. Um, but there is a sense that I guess, as you, I mean, what you call the social importance of it, or the, the kind of the wider cultural importance of these days and structuring of the, you know, the, the festival calendar was something which was maybe just too kind of deeply rooted in, in social life generally to be completely taken away. Um, I don't think any of these four saints were particularly associated with, uh, you know, like, I mean, the, you know, obviously not the, the um, status of Martinus or anything like that, but of course they would have been, um, I see someone's just put in the chat, associated with kind of days of markets and fairs and um, and used in for kind of pragmatic purposes um, as, as dates in the calendar often were. So they had a use um, from that point of view as well. So they were kind of days worth remembering and people worth remembering, um, even if they weren't being liturgically commemorated. I think that's right. Thank you very much indeed for the question and for the answer. Um, could I invite Mr. and Mrs. Comer to put their question, please, if you'd like to unmute. Um, my question is, do you see significance in the fact that during the coronation service, the coronation crown, St. Edward's crown, is taken off in the, the chapel of, of uh, St. Edward in, in Westminster Abbey? And then replaced by the state crown, which the queen or king will wear for the rest of their reign? <laughs> That's a very good question. I can't say that I have uh, real, really any knowledge of the coronation service, so I can't answer that question, I think, but that is, that's a very interesting one. I mean, um, the, 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 you know, the importance of, of the idea of King Edward's crown, St Edward's crown, as a, a kind of symbol of the, the monarchy and something of that kind of continued continuity uh, is certainly an interesting detail, but I don't know about its specific use in the coronation service. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take a couple of questions now from the chat box. Uh, Patricia Kavanagh-Brown asks, how benign um, was the conversion of England to Christianity? 
<laughs> That's a very fair question. The answer is it's somewhat varied. Um, as I said, the different regions of Anglo-Saxon England kind of converted at different rates. Um, and so in some places, it seems to have been a largely peaceful and kind of negotiated conversion. I mean, the famous story is, of course, what Bede, the one Bede tells us about, first of all, the conversion of Kent and then Northumbria. You know, Kent, you have St. Augustine. I'm sure, I'm sure most of you know these stories. Um, uh, Augustine kind of negotiating with King Ethelbert to, to accept Christianity and then in Northumbria um, that famous story of the council of King Edwin and his um, his advisors discussing um, how brief life, life is as brief as the flight of a sparrow through the mead hall and therefore um, Christianity offers you some degree of uh, stability and, and um, kind of certainty uh, by contrast to, to pagan belief. And that would give the impression that at least the conversion was a sort of um, relatively peaceful uh, um, kind of process, but then there are other parts of England where it was imposed rather more um, by power, I suppose, rather than by negotiation. So um, it kind of it depended quite a lot on the re the reaction of local leaders to um, to what Christianity, the Christian missionaries were, were kind of trying to give them, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Norman. Would you like to put your question? Hmm. Um, firstly, thank you for a very fascinating talk, um, lots to think about. Um, I've got two questions, if I may. Um, the first one is, um, were there any other um, English royal saints on the um, Sarum or other pre-Reformation calendars that um, didn't make it into the uh, post-Reformation calendar? Yes, yeah, so there were quite a few. I mentioned um, St Oswald of Northumbria, um, again, a saint who appears uh, prominently in Bede's ecclesiastical history. So, you know, there's quite a lot known of him. He was very popular um, in certain parts of the country. Um, I mentioned St Kenelm of Mercia. There are other um, kind of saints who are sort of semi-commemorated, like Alfred the Great, for instance, um, even um, King Edgar um, was sort of semi-regarded <laughs> as a saint um, in some places. So, um, Yes, there, there are quite a quite a few, and a, a lot of um, other female saints sort of connected to Ethelreda. Um, so her sisters and her nieces and her daughters and people like St Mildred of Kent and um, Sixborough of Minster in Thanet and um, lots of other Kentish saints. Mm -hmm. So yes, quite a lot of royal saints who, who kind of were in, but obviously there was some variation um, between different parts of the, the country yeah. and calendars in who was commemorated where. Um, mm. Yeah. And I suppose, was it the case that the ones that um, were kept after the Reformation, was that just to sort of mark particular um, events that they were associated um, with in, in the sort of, as in, well, fairs and markets, as somebody said earlier? I think it was partly that. And then also it was the sense that these saints did have very widespread cultural importance. I mean, you know, I've been talking about the specific kind of the royal importance of, of these particular saints, but um, a number of the other saints, um, you know, I mean, someone like St. Dunstan was a very widely known, very widely loved saint. Um, churches were named after these saints. Um, people were named after these saints. You know, individuals adopted them as, as kind of, or had a sense of them as, as patrons. So um, there was, I think to, to some degree, the, these um, this veneration was was kind of too deeply rooted to be completely pulled down, pulled out. Even though some people would, of course, have liked to do so, and that's also true of of the non English saints. I mean, people like Saint Catherine or Saint Margaret, um, who are you know largely kind of legendary saints, some of them at least, but they do appear in in the calendar because they have this wider cultural importance. Hmm. Yeah, um, and then the other thing I wanted to ask was, um, which I think already um, touched on. Um, which was, um, did any of the, were any of the royal saints um, that, uh, of the four that um, we were speaking on, did any of them, um, were any of them particularly venerated more than the rest of the four? That's a good question. I think my sense is that Edmund was probably the most popular. Um, he's certainly the one you will encounter most often as you sort of go around medieval churches and you see him in stained glass windows and wall paintings. And, you know, the, the story of his death was so incredibly dramatic with the Vikings and the arrows and stuff. I mean, he's very, very recognisable. Um, so I think probably he was the most sort of genuinely popular. Um, Edward the Confessor has kind of always been a very significant figure in English history because of his kind of pivotal role in the Norman Conquest. And that, you know, that, that's in, in some sense a kind of foundational moment in, in British history, which everybody knows about the Norman Conquest. So um, Edward the Confessor kind of has a status for that point of view. Um, yeah, I think Edward, Edmund would be my... my Thank you. <laughs> Uh, 
um, and one's only got to go to Pickering in North Yorkshire, um, where I grew up and um, sang matins first um, under the wall painting of, of St Edmund, mm -hmm. um, full of arrows. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much indeed um, for the question there um, and for the answer. I'm going to take a few now from the chat box. Um, we have one here from Mr. Saralati. So did the commemoration of black letter saints for whom there is no liturgical provision in the prayer book begin anew only with the Oxford movement or were there informal ways of commemoration already earlier? Yeah, I see somebody's answered that and said that I think liturgical provision only came with the late Victorian and Edwardian missals and high church altar books such as Percy Dim's English liturgy. And that is my understanding as well, that it's largely a feature of the 19th century, but I'm very happy to be corrected if anyone is uh, more, uh, more of an expert on that later, later commemoration. Thank you, and thank you to Mr. Sunman for um, for typing an answer into that question. Um, Mr. Castry asks, are we any closer to knowing um, who painted the Wilton Diptych? I don't think so. I mean, it is an absolutely fantastic piece of, of art and very precious survival, but um, I think, as with most medieval art, the, the artist is likely to remain anonymous. Thank you. Um, Canon Burroughs is asking, um, does their inclusion imply a link between Edward King and Martyr and Edward VI and also between Ethel Reader and the Virgin Queen Elizabeth? I was wondering about that as I was writing this, I was thinking, is that going a little bit too far? I think, I definitely think the importance of the name Edward, just as a, even as a royal name was clearly something that was, you know, still felt in the 16th century. As far as the Virgin Queen, I mean, I, I was thinking about that as I was reading Bede's hymn and so on. I suppose this is a little early for um, Elizabeth to be regarded primarily as a virgin queen. I must, there, there must still have been hope that she wasn't, <laughs> she would marry. Um, so I don't know the idea of like the, um, it might be, I'm not, I, that didn't quite quite work um, as far as I was trying to work it out, but um, certainly I think an image of a powerful queen might well have been one that resonated in the, the 16th century for that reason, you know, that Ethel Drader is a specifically um, a, a, a kind of, um, a very independent and a, um, a royal queen, not only, not important through who she's married to in any sense, you know, or even through her who her father is, but she's sort of presented, at least in the medieval sources, as a kind of a, a ruler in her own right, um, even if the ruler of Ely rather than of a kingdom. Um, so I think certainly that as a, a an image of female rulership or leadership, she she could have provided a very interesting model. Thank you very much. I can't see any more questions in the chat box because I hope I've picked them all up um, and no one is indicating that they wish to ask a question. Um, so could I thank um, everyone who's participated this evening um, and contributed to the uh, to the discussion and submitted questions. Um, and again to you, Dr. Parker, for that really superb um, and fascinating presentation, which I'm sure um, everyone who's taken part this evening will have thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and, we'll, and doubtless everyone will want to go back to the YouTube video um, and watch again and pick up fresh insights from it. If you're not a member of the Prayer Book Society and you've participated in this series, um, I would encourage you to visit our website www.pbs.org.uk where you can find out what the Society is doing. Um, if you wish to join us, um, and I very much hope that you want to do so, um, you can do so online. And if you use the discount code PBS50, you can get 25% off um, your first year of membership. And if you've taken part in this series and you're already a member um, and you'd like to make a donation towards the costs that we incur um, running these events, we wish to make them free, of course, um, then you can also make a donation via the website um, or you can send a cheque to Copyhold Farm um, or call the office there. So I'm going to draw to close now with prayer. Let us pray. O Almighty God, who has knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of thy Son, Christ our Lord, grant us grace so to follow thy blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living that we may come to those unspeakable joys 
which thou hast prepared for them that unfeignedly love thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we look towards now the days of, uh, the closing days of Holy Week and Easter, Almighty God, we beseech thee graciously to behold this thy family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was contented to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Over the past five weeks at this point, my colleagues and I um, have been able to announce the title of next week's speaker, um, at the, at next week's title of, of the seminar. And I'm really sorry um, that we've now come to a close and I'm not able to do that. Um, however, there will be more of these seminars in the future. Um, we've received lots and lots of feedback from people indicating that they would like us to do more. Um, and so we've got some plans hopefully in place now um, for, for an Advent seminar and also for next Lent. And I very much hope that you'll all be able to participate then. It just remains for me now to wish you well for these coming days of commemoration and of celebration as we open our hearts to the gifts and the graces which God offers to us in these days. Pray that our faith may be renewed as we grow in the knowledge and love of God that we see in Christ Jesus our Lord. Good night and God bless you all. <laughs>